All right, so today we get into some of the appendix material of NLP. The main thing we're going to talk about today is word vectors and basically what word vectors are and where they come from. Uh, I will say because this is appendix material, I'm actually using the materials by actually one of my old coworkers from the New York campus. So that's why I have this linked here. If you're interested to see what other uh, students are using, some of the lecture material in this repo is mine, um, but there's also stuff from other instructors just in case you wanted to like maybe see more from other uh, from other campuses. Uh, feel free to just explore that. Um, within word vectors, there are two libraries. I'll just walk through processes of GenSim and Spacey. Um, I'm just gonna walk through the two of them and how you can use them as different pre-processing methods. And then lastly, I wanted to show you all topic modeling, which is basically a soft clustering technique uh, that's actually really neat for NLP. It'll, if you give it like a bunch of text, it'll be able to show you what the main topics are uh, that are being discussed in the text. So we'll take a look at an example later. But to start, um, I'm gonna go through this slideshow, not super in depth, because um, I mean, as in depth as this is, um, just to get into like what word embeddings are. So word embeddings, not something that we've really heard of as of yet, but very, very powerful. And I'll get to why that is. So you can see here the rhetorical question that's presented is what is meaning? Um, and if you remember our bag of words methods that we had on Thursday, where we did like a count vectorizer or a TFIDF vectorizer, now none of that really takes into account the context like the ordering of your words, that's one thing. And also, you know, are there like nuances that result as a, that are a result of a combination of words? Um, so word embedding sort of helped to tackle that problem. So you think about what meaning is. Uh, meaning could be the idea represented by text, the idea that a person wants to convey by using words, or even more abstract, the idea expressed in a work of writing or in art. Let's think about how a computer interprets language. Let's start with this side, count vectorizer, TFIDF. So as I mentioned before, these are all bag of words methods. Every column is a word. Uh, and because of that, there is no notion of similarity or meaning of the individual words. Um, it really only gives the context of importance in, cor in a corpus. And that's the case for TFIDF. So uh, for example, if I have like a tweets written about hotels. The Plaza Hotel and the Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria, both are New York hotels, should have a high similarity, but um, this method of text pre-processing doesn't necessarily capture that. Well, another way to represent language is in synonyms. So this is, again, only true in certain sentence contexts. For example, if proficient is listed as a synonym for good, um, again, this would have to be hard coded in. I'm pretty sure that there are libraries out there that, you know, hard code the similar meanings of words. Uh, but again, it's very hard coded, also subjective. Sometimes when you're using the word um, good, you don't know if it's in saying that all right, something is great or like, I'm good, like, I'm okay. Um, basically, different meanings of words might not be captured. Again, because this is likely going to be hard coded. And I, again, I don't expect anyone to use like hard coded synonyms, but it's hard to update new words in slang as well as manually upkeeping a thesaurus. It's just tough. Uh, so these are just some ways a computer can potentially interpret language from things that we know so far. So next we're gonna think about words represented by context. So this whole idea of distributional semantics sort of sets the stage for word embeddings. So distributional semantics just means that a word's meaning is given by the words that frequently appear around it. So when a word appears in a document, its context is the set of words that appear nearby within a fixed size window. So in this case, it's a window of 10. I forget if they call it 10 or five. So it's like five words before and five words after. Uh, so basically some the computer or your model will learn the meaning of the word banking based on all of the words that have appeared around the word banking. So you don't exactly have like an exact definition of the word banking, but instead 
you are able to learn context by these words around it. So for example, with banking, you say, all right, probably government has something to do with it. Debt has something to do with it. Banking has problems, crises, 2009, regulation, different countries, uh, India, Europe is a continent. Um, so if you give it a lot of examples of sentences where the word banking is used, you imagine you can sort of slowly learn and put together the meaning of the word banking. And this is how word embeddings are created. I'm gonna get into more detail, but as of now, any questions? Here's one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we, do we have to create a, right, a dictionary kind of thing where like wherever banking is used, we use a lot of statements. And let's say if we create a list and yeah. then, right it will be it's probably going to be an endless list if we create oh for sure yeah good news is a lot of these like this is already done for you i'll show you the result of that in my in the notebook later on but no you do not have to do this you can and there are libraries that make it easy for you to do this and i'll point mm -hmm. basically jen sim will show you how you can do this and i'll point you to uh how you can do that i i believe Actually, I believe in the lessons they walk you through an example of creating your own version of this. Um, but very likely you won't have to because there are already uh, ones that have been trained and I'll, and I'll show an example of that later. Okay, so they, I mean, there are existing codes for like, okay, refer this particular function mm -hmm. or this particular library where mm -hmm. you can just pick it up. Yeah, I will not so much like existing code, but literally existing word vectors, which is the result of this. So for mm -hmm. like, I think, I think over like 400,000 words, uh, they already have this pre-trained for you. And I'll walk, I'll get more into that in a little bit. Okay. Any other questions thus far? Yeah, mm -hmm. could you um, just redefine word vector? Why a vector? Mm, yeah, I'm actually just about to get into okay, the vector, okay, but, but but yeah, basically every word, a result of this is that every word will be represented by some list of numbers, by an array of numbers. Um, but yeah, we'll get into it in a little bit as well. Okay. Awesome. All right. So word to vec which is a library that we will use within Jensim, um, is actually using a neural network. We haven't gotten to neural networks yet, but honestly, to use this, you don't really have to use any neural networks. But basically how these vectors are created. And as I just mentioned to Henry, um, the result of this is every word will then be represented by like, for example, a hundred different numbers. What each number means doesn't matter, but you can represent a word by a hundred dimensions. And we'll actually take a look at some examples in the notebook later. But how word to vec works is it's actually using a shallow neural net. And again, that will make sense when we get to neural networks later on to basically compute a dense vector representation for each word. So that means in a hundred numbers, it's sort of embedded the meaning of a word. So you can see that it captures the meaning of a word in a corpus. So it captures the meaning of a word in like a document or a group of documents using these predefined windows of words. Um, the vectors that we're going to use later on are pre-trained. So that means that someone has already done all of this training. Uh, I think the example that we're gonna be using is trained on, I wanna say, I wanna say it's Twitter, if not Wikipedia, but basically someone has built word vectors by looking through all of Wikipedia as an example and looking for every single um, instance of the word banking and is trying to figure out, all right, what's the best way to represent the word banking as a hundred different numbers? And this is all relative to every other word that appears in the corpus. So we'll take a look at we'll take a look at some examples later. It is very, very abstract what the numbers are, but we'll take a look at some applications for it. And for our purposes, we really only need to understand the applications of this, not so much like how these word vectors are being created. But yeah, there are two kinds of different ways this is done. We won't get into that because it's not necessary for us. Um, and yeah, as I just said, there are readily available pre-trained embeddings. So another word for word vectors is word embeddings um, on different corpus such as Wikipedia, 
and Google News. So I think maybe the one that we have is Google News, but we'll take a look at it later. So the whole word to vec is kind of like an umbrella term for turning a word to a vector. So we'll skip this. These are basically two different ways to create the word vectors, but um, you probably won't have to know this unless you're an, you are a natural language processing engineer. So a result of word vectors is you can sort of find patterns between words. And we're actually gonna go through a few examples. So word vectors can be of any length. And usually if you download pre-trained word vectors, they are of some fixed length. Um, so for example, the ones that we're gonna see later, every word is represented by a hundred numbers. And let's just assume that in this diagram, all of these words are represented by a hundred numbers. So basically a hundred columns. And what's done here is we've done PCA to reduce it to two dimensions, just so we can see the patterns within words. So the result of word vectors, and you can see these are all superlatives, right? We have slow, slower, slowest, short, shorter, shortest. Another example, we have clear, clearer, clearest. And what's interesting that all of these, this is a plot of all of their word vectors. And what's really cool to see is that we have similar patterns going from, you know, the root word to like the ER version of the word to the EST version of the word. I mean, they all are not, they're not in the same place because they're all different words, but they have similar patterns. You can imagine like the angle going from slow to slower is very, very similar to the angle going from like dark to darker and same from like slower to slowest, stronger, strongest. And this is just a PCA uh, representation of these word vectors. Any questions about what we're seeing here? All right, well, there are some other examples coming up. Um, within word vectors, what's really awesome is that if you're training it on something that is not of like dictionary words. So for example, we have all of these names, we have like CEOs and different companies. Uh, you can learn stuff about CEOs and the companies or the words of like the CEO's name or the words, the company's name, you can still create word vectors in those because it doesn't matter if it's a dictionary word or not. All of that matters is that enough words are used before and after such word to create a word vector. So you can see here uh, going from company to CEO is a similar relationship as well. Um, but yeah. Any questions before we hop into the notebook and actually see like what word vectors are and how we use them? So, so the number, oh, like yes, word, Henry. Okay, okay. So the numbers, do they have any meaning? The zero, I see there's a zero, zero in hmm. the middle of it all and the negative point eight to positive point eight. Yeah, you're right. These are, these have no meaning at all. So even, yes, this is PC8. And I mean, these are principal components, but yeah, they have no meaning at all. Okay. Kishore? Yeah. So my question is like, so if the words which uh, which are used as uh, the short form or uh, they are like synonyms for, let, let's say, instead of doctor writing as D-O-C-T-O-R, they just write D-R. Mm. In such cases, right, uh, can we uh, uh, train it in such a manner that, okay, they, you, they take both the words and uh, uh, what do you say, find what is the relevant meaning? Oh, that's a good question. I'm actually not too sure if, so what words have word vectors, it really depends on the library that you're using. So, hmm. well, actually I can run the code for doctor and let's see what happens later on. Hmm. Yeah. Um, anything else before we go into the notebook? Cool. All right, so I already ran a bunch of this. Um, so I'm not gonna rerun a bunch of stuff, but the new things that we're using here, we have PCA. We're gonna see some PCA word vectors in a little bit, very similar to what we just saw. And here to start, we're gonna use the library GenSim. Now GenSim allows you to download a bunch of pre-trained word vectors. Uh, here you can see, oh, if my notebook would stop being slow. Sorry guys, all right, let's open this and let's open this. So basically this is just an intro to GenSim that I think is very helpful. What I like about this is it shows you what available models there are. So here you can see what I'm using is I'm using the Glove Wiki GigaWord 100. So the number 100 just stands for the fact that each word vector is gonna be of length 100. We'll see an example 
in more in depth later, but here you can see the word caffeine is represented by these hundred numbers. Uh, why I talk about this is because I use glove wiki gigaword here. Uh, and basically what this table is showing us is that this was trained on Wikipedia in 2014. Um, it was trained on 6 billion tokens. Um, and this number stands for the, I, yeah, it has 400,000 words that exist in this library. Um, if you go to the same one, but with length 300, basically each vector would be of length 300. The idea is you get a lot more nuanced, but the downside is your computational time will increase. Um, and here you can see all bunch of different uh, word vectors that already exist. So for example, mine had 400,000. These are in the millions. Glove is in the millions. The Glove Twitter one is in the millions where you're trained on 2 billion tweets, 27 billion tokens. Um, here you can see yeah, 1.2 million vectors. So that means the, there is 1.2 million vectors that already exist in this data set when you download it. So, so uh, one, mm -hmm. one quick question. So what happens like uh, when you say like uh, uh, the length of uh, the vector is 100 or like mm -hmm. 200, yeah. uh, how that is uh, defined or? Mm -hmm. uh, it's up to you to decide the length of the vectors that you want based on what's available. So usually if you have a longer vector, you have more precise information. You imagine if you're using, you know, if you, if let's say you have an item and you represent it with four columns, you don't have too much information, but if you represent the same item in like 10 columns, you have more information. So kind of that logic. So the columns become vector or the length of the... So the number of numbers words. in your vector is the number of columns. Uh, okay. Yeah, so this will determine the, the number of columns in your data set. So when we uh, when we actually let's say scale it up and then use it, it will have better results. Um, better results is subjective, uh, but yeah, you typically will get more nuanced results if you use longer vectors. Okay. Yeah, and for the purpose of like this notebook, I use a hundred. Hmm. Um, and basically, this is the documentation that I showed you all. Um, that I've linked for you all that basically shows you all the different things that you can use with a word vector, which is actually, I'm going to run through some of them because they're really, really interesting. So within word vectors, and you can see that I've loaded all of the word vectors into this variable word vector. And it kind of works like a dictionary where you can just pick a word and find its word vector. So caffeine is here. Um, Kishore, you said you wanted to look for doctor. Doctor has this vector here. Let's just collapse this real quick. And let's just see whether doctor has one. Oh, so doctor does have one. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the functionality. And I'm just curious to see, honestly, like whether doctor spelled D-O-C-T-O-R is going to be similar to doctor D-R. Let's, we'll take a look in a little bit. Uh, basically, you can look up word vectors for individual words um, that exist in basically, yeah, about 400,000 words exist in this list of word vectors. So you can look up for multiple. So in this case, I'm just looking across four of them. So I get a list of four word vectors. Now, more specific use cases. Um, and again, th these methods are really cool just for like exploration purposes you can actually find most similar words. So for example, here I was just looking for, and it's literally a built-in function. Um, I'm looking for words that are most similar to coffee. You have tea, drinks, beer, cocoa, wine, drink, so on and so forth. Sorry, my computer's lagging out again. Um, it works for named entities as well. So you can see here Hilton, uh, which is a hotel. Um, most similar words, I get other hotels, uh, but also the word hotel, which is neat. Vegas, um, so on and so forth. Now, out of curiosity, let's see what's most similar to the word doctor. So with doctor, you can see that doctor spelled DR is listed there as well. So potential, so what that's saying is that the vectors for doctor and doctor spelled DR are very, very similar. So yeah, 
And, and what is that actually. number after each one? Like the 76, ah. per, is that 76 percent for physician or something like that? Great, percentages? great question. That's um that's a similarity value. So I believe it ranges from negative one to one. Um, it's literally just like the difference between the two vectors. Um, okay. Yeah. I forget what similarity metric this uses specifically, honestly, but um, honestly, it, does, it shouldn't matter. So you can have negative numbers too if they're if they're polar opposites or they're, That's they're right. totally dissimilar. Okay. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Like, can, can you run that function like the least similar or something like that? Is there such a thing? I don't know if there is a least similar. Let's see. Uh, is there a different one? Okay, let's look at similar. Um, okay, there's too many of them with similar. So okay, well, cosine similarities, but I. There are a couple others that we'll see that you could sort of find. I wouldn't be surprised if, I'd be surprised if they didn't have a least similar. Or maybe, well, they definitely have opposites, but least similar, I'm not too sure. Okay. Well, but yeah, we can take a look at some of the other things that, um, that they have built in. Um, what's kind of cool here um, is you can have it, you can feed it in multiple different, uh, parameters. So for example, if we want to find something that is similar to a woman king, but is not a man. So positive woman king, negative man. Um, it gives you the result of queen, which is pretty neat. So it's basically, all right, what is a woman version of a king? Um, making sure that it's not a man, you get queen. So all of that is kind of built into the word vectors, which is really neat. Um, other similar things that you can do is um, you can think of analogies. So in the, this was basically an analogy, like what is a, uh, sorry, like king to man is analogous to woman queen. This is just a really simple function that does that. So for uh, Japan to Japanese, Australia maps to Australian, um, or you can see that they also give you like New Zealand for New Zealand, British, Australian, so on and so forth. And you can see the same done here. Um, likely you won't be doing this like as part of your project, but it's just really neat to show that all of this information is embedded in like a hundred numbers. Um, they're really just doing mathematical operations on these words um, to get these results, which is really neat. So you can do this with a bunch of different things. I just have a, a lot of examples here. This notebook is also on the repo. Uh, another really interesting one, uh, you can also see like what's the odd one out. So this is, I guess, kind of like a difference, um, but I do a dot split so that all of these words are in a list and it'll just pick out the odd one out. And I thought this was funny because Brexit, uh, but I don't think that's what it is. I, it just sees that England is the most different out of the four. Maybe because it's non-continental Europe is my guess. Oh yeah, that's a good idea too. Mm -hmm. But just keep in mind that these, like the meaning of these words is really just what's, what this model has learned right. from 2014 Wikipedia. So the words that were surrounding France, Germany and Russia were more similar to each other versus England which I thought was really interesting. Uh, um, mm -hmm. insula, can you just put the insula of Russia, USSR and C, let's see what happens. Yeah, let's see if, yeah. So it finds that USSR is the one that's most different. It's hard to say exactly why and what it is that, you know, they're picking out as a difference because everything is an embedding. And the fact that, you know, these hundred numbers don't have any meaning. You're, you can't say that, all right, this is the Europe component of the vector or whatever. You cannot say that. So, I mean, there's a little bit of opaqueness to that just because yes, this is the result of a neural network, um, but yeah. Um, any other questions before we move on? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to actually ask you about the API part of it. Well, hmm. the API works similar to, right, uh, when we use a database, just pull pulling the database and keeping it within the yeah mm -hmm. book. yeah. And this is not sim. This is not like the same like API as like the API that we use to get data. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just like the way that it loads. See, the API is coming from the Gensim downloader. This mm -hmm. is just what they say that you should 
alias it as. So yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. So that, that's one thing I was actually confused, like why they are using API as. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because technically I... it is a, it is an application programming interface. The fact that you can download all of this stuff through that, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't know why they chose to alias it that way. Okay. All right. Uh, well, something that is obvious that all of these things, all of these vectors and all of these methods are all performed on individual words. And so far, like the text documents that we would be classifying or like, you know, building a model on are often more than just like single words. So how can we combine and do like, a, and find like a potential vector for like a whole sentence, for example. Um, so there are different ways to go about this. If you're using GenSim, this first library, the easiest way is to actually just add the vectors together. And so when you add the vectors together, you have the meanings for each of the words in a sentence averaged out. So this is a quick um, example of how to get the vector for the sentence. I like my coffee hot. So what I'm doing here is I'm well splitting it first so it becomes a list of words. And then I'm just appending the word vector to a list of vectors here if it exists. Um, and you see except key error. So basically I'll show you why I put that exception there. And then after that, I'm just gonna sum it together. And then this would end up being the, the data for that row for this sentence. So basically if, you know, let's say the project is a bunch of tweets, uh, with every tweet, you would just do this process and then you'll have like a tweet vector and then you can run your model on this data. Um, what I also wanted to show you all real quick is that why you have this key error is because if you look up the word I, I actually does not have a vector, which makes sense. It's kind of like a stop word. But yeah, I gives you a key error that is not in the vocabulary. So um, yes, it has 400,000 words, but it doesn't have every single word. You're likely to run into these key errors. So if you're going to do this, um, you should do like a try and accept. Um, so yeah, if you do this for like each observation in your NLP data set, you can throw this into your model. And I actually have, do I have an example? Uh, yeah, I have an example for the next one, not this one, unfortunately. Wait, so when you're summing the vectors together, are you doing like the, is it zero vector then one vector, I mean like each number in the array and that's what you're summing together? Yeah, that's right. So um, imagine like each vector is a length of a hundred. You're just gonna sum like the first argument for each the second argument okay. for each, and you're basically, yeah, you're just flattening them. And so what is that, what does that sum in, in the meaning? Or you so that, that is basically like an aggregated, um, you can sort of think of it as like a, an overall meaning vector. Again, it's all okay. abstract numbers. So you can, you can assume that that vector just contains all the meaning of every word in the sentence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right then. Um, one other thing that I thought was pretty cool to show is that if you have these 100 dimension vectors, you can use PCA uh, to graph the words in space. So what we're gonna do here in this, um, in this example, I'm gonna take a bunch of words and this function will take in this list of words later on. Um, and then we're going to fit a PCA model so that is in it is in two dimensions. Um, this code, you can write your own version of it if you'd like, but you can see that with all of these word vectors, if I were to plot them, what's pretty interesting is words that are more similar end up closer together. I'm trying to zoom in, but my computer is a little bit slow. So just an example, we can see here that on the top left, we have all like the food and drinks. You can see like food is on the lower end, drinks are on the upper end of this clump. Here you have a bunch of animals. Here you have, I don't know, like places. I guess water is kind of random, but you have like countries in Europe, uh, China's here, Australia, I guess this goes more south and here you have like institutions. Of course, you imagine this is a hundred dimension collapsed into two, 
but even so you can sort of find out where in this abstract space each word belongs and it's just interesting to see that you know words that are similar end up getting closer together any questions or comments on this uh, if we increase the size of the plot right mm -hmm. we have more clarity or it will take time um probably not i i would say that in terms of clarity not really i i i mean these are literally just like 100 data points uh sorry 100 dimensions squashed down into two so it wouldn't get clearer um possibly if you just have like more specific examples you can find out where they are so if you want to add let's i don't know add the word like um let's see what's a, an example this let's, let's see the word science and see where that turns up if i add the word science you can see that it comes very very close to school to i forgot what college university um yeah but in terms of clarity not really okay yeah but you sort of get a sense of like what words are more similar to each other versus things that are not as similar mm -hmm. any other questions cool well moving on i want to talk about another library that you can do this similar thing is uh, a, you, that you can do this similar thing in but in a slightly different way is this other library called spacey and spacey has its own group of models as well so in that tab earlier and i think my computer is lagging out again sorry everybody um oh, what just happened here um in yeah in the other tab you saw all those libraries were listed out spacey has its own libraries too um if my computer would get working all right there we go so for spacey i'm just going to use spacey on this um on this example um this is the same one that we had on thursday this is our satire versus non-satire um data set and what i'm doing here is spacey has its own like uh his own models that you can load um and so if you look into here let's give it a second to open up there we go spacey here you can see that one they have a bunch of different languages which is really cool um and then within english which is the one that we're using you can have either small medium or large and basically the vector length for a large is 300 medium is oh wait i forgot I don't remember off the top of my head. I believe this, the small one should be 96. This one, I forget. This one says 300, but this one also says 300. Oh, but this one just has more vectors, I think. Yeah, 20,000 unique vectors versus 685. But anyways, for our purposes, I'm just gonna use the small one because it was the fastest one to download. I will tell you if any of you are using word embeddings in either this coming project or the next one, um, you will have to run these cells and then th this cell as well as the api.load cell takes a long time to run because it's literally downloading all of those vectors but anyways i'm using just their smallest uh, uh their smallest model right now and spacey is really really neat because they do everything for you so you can see here that this is my raw data and this is the body of text that i'm going to do my pre-processing on um, and what I'm doing is I'm loading the dictionary into this variable I just called NLP. And here you can apply it onto every row. So just by doing this one step automatically, it does all of the cleaning for you. Um, it does the tokenization and it basically turns every word and every document into a vector. Um, details which I will go over right now. So um, any questions at this point? I don't know about like the introduction to Spacey that I just went through. Well, I, I noticed it doesn't get rid of the stop words for you. Yeah, it doesn't get rid of the stop words and there's a good reason why that is. And I'll talk about that in just a sec. Okay. Yeah, but that's a good observation. Yeah. Um, usually in word vectors, 
you don't want to get rid of stop words because stop words could add to the context a little bit. Again, not every stop word does. Like for example, you saw that I didn't have a vector. Um, I believe that in spacey, more words have vectors. Um, so yeah, typically people actually do prefer using spacey over Jensen. But Jensen has all those cool, like most similar to, or like those analogy uh, methods. Um, but yeah, anyways, let's take a look at what this result is. So what's really neat is that each element under spacey becomes its own object. So first spacey is just gonna be this first value that I have here. So what's really neat is you can see here, I'm printing the type of first spacey and it becomes like a spacey document. And then I also printed the type of the first token in spacey and it's its own token object. So what's cool is you have the vector for the entire document and also the vector for each individual word. Again, depending on which you wanna end up using, all of it is embedded in here, which is really cool. Um, there is a lot, a lot of functionality between doc and token. So I've just linked the documentation here. So you can take a look that uh, for the entire document, there is this vector here. So this vector of length 96 represents the entire first uh, article. So this entire thing of noting that the resignation of James Mattis, so on and so forth. Uh, within that, you can also get the vector for each individual word, which also happens to be of length 96. Um, why stop words are not gotten rid of? If you were to do the similar thing as what we did earlier with Jensim and add in all of the and add all of the vectors for every word in the document together, you actually end up with a different result than this. I don't think I have an example in this notebook, but uh, basically this document vector does take into account the order of your words and adjust the vector based on that. So this actually does contain I would say the most context out of all the vectors that we've looked at. So because of that, usually we're dealing with word vectors, people like to use spacey. But I know I said a lot of words in the past minute. Any questions to clarify? Okay. So something else that's pretty neat. Uh, Henry, at the very start, we talked about part of speech tagging, which was an NLTK thing. Um, there's also part of speech tagging in Spacey. So if you needed to get the information, that is there. But what's really cool is that the part of speech tagging is also already embedded in the document vector. So you actually would not have to do that if you're doing word vectors with Spacey, which is really neat. But yeah, all of this information is already like embedded in the document vector here. All right, so just an example of how you would use this in a project. Um, all we have to do now is just put all of the vectors together. So here you can see I have 96 columns starting from zero to 95. And I took my 100 rows of data and I vectorize all of it. So again, to reiterate, these numbers by themselves have zero meaning at all. But then you can actually just take this and throw it into your uh, classification model. You can literally run naive Bayes with this data and you should be able to get a result. Does each word, does each line represent a word or an article? Mm. Each line represents an article. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're the sum of the vectors in the of the words in the article. Yeah. So this these 96 numbers are just some abstract representation of the article. Okay. Yeah. And you can assume that it has learned nuances of, you know words in a certain order of, I mean, it also takes into account, um, like as I think as you can see, uh, the very first document had the words like James Mattis, and even those words have vectors themselves, um, which I think is really cool too. So yeah, it has all the information embedded in 96, uh, in 96 numbers. Um, if you use the model that had a, had a longer dimension, the 300 word, the 300 length vectors, you would have 300 numbers that represent the one article. So again, you can imagine that with 300 columns, you could run your model 
your model will take a little bit longer to run, but you have more room for nuances, which is really interesting. But yeah, this is literally the data frame that you would throw into your model. One huge downside of using word embeddings is the fact that um, when you do a feature importances, it doesn't really mean anything. It'll be very, very hard to figure out, all right, what are the specific words that are leading to a classification, whichever way. So that is something that you unfortunately will not be able to get using uh, by using word embeddings. However, might be even stronger because things like context, things like emotion through words is captured a lot better in word embeddings versus something like a bag of words methods like count vectorizer or TF idea. So um, usually people would test both to see which they, or again, depending on what your problem is, whether it's important that you figure out what the important words are or not, you might decide to use one over the other. Cool. Well, the last thing I wanted to share is actually not even in the curriculum, but I thought it is, it is a very, very interesting thing to share. And that's topic modeling. And as I've mentioned before, or at the start of today's study group, I mentioned that topic modeling is a soft clustering algorithm. And the, the specific algorithm is called LDA, which stands for latent Dirichlet allocation. Uh, the math that goes behind LDA is very, very complicated. It's a very, very similar process to SVD, um, but slightly different. Uh, but I just wanted to show an example of how I'm using LDA uh, as an EDA tool or as, a, or as a tool to just have you learn more about your data set. So two parts to this. One, there's LDA and LDA comes from Jensen, I believe. Wait, let me just double check real quick. Yeah, LDA comes from Jensen. On top of that, there is this thing called Pi LDA Viz which allows you to visualize your clusters in a very, very intuitive way. And basically it is, ooh, what is this? I want this. And it's basically something that looks like this. I'll explain this later on, but you can see this is interactive. You can see like different words and we'll get into that later. Uh, but again, LDA is a soft clustering algorithm. And what soft clustering is, uh, if you remember our k-means and our HAC, those are hard clustering algorithms because every data point is only in a single cluster. With soft clustering, you actually get some probability. So each data point has like a probability of belonging to multiple clusters. It doesn't have to be all, it can be like two out of four, so on and so forth. In a very similar way to clustering with LDA, you have to tell it how many clusters you want. So if you wanna run LDA, it has a kind of annoying pre-processing process where the, they actually want your data to be in a, in a list of lists. So I just have this function here and I'm actually using the word embeddings. Yeah, I'm using the word embeddings here. Um, and you can see that my, um, my data is in, in lists of lists. So every, Every article is now a list of words, and each article is aggregated into a giant list. Two different parts to this. First, you have to create your dictionary and your corpus. And this is basically um, all of the words that exist in your data set. Corpus, what it actually is not super important. If this would run, I'm trying to scroll down a little bit, but it's taking a while. This notebook's pretty heavy because I have two models downloaded plus an interactive visualization. But for corpus, what this is, is just doing a term document frequency. Um, so basically it's counting up the words and it's embedded in numbers because in the first ID2 word, um, it associates every word with a number. So this is just like a more efficient way of um, representing your corpus. And then this is where the modeling is. So in this model, you can see I have my corpus, I have my ID to word, I have my dictionary. This is where I tell it how many clusters I want or how many topics I want it to pick out. Here, I just set four. Um, random state, not very important. Update every, not important either. The rest is just all for like gradient descent, not, not super important. But this takes a little bit to run. You'll see that when it's done running, without the visualization component, this is what I get. Um, not very clear in this output, 
but you can see here there are four tuples so first there is zero which goes from here to here if this would run there we go so this is our first cluster where you can see it's talking about year country also percent include state many world um, the second cluster is say government would official the third cluster people police so and so forth um, not the easiest thing to read, so therefore we put it into Pi LDA Viz, uh, which is this, which is a library that allows you to get to create this visualization and it does it all automatically for you. Basically, from my LDA model, all I have to do is plug it into this one line and I get this output, which is really neat. So you can see here, these are my four topics that it has clustered. Um, this is PCA. So based on this, you could argue that maybe three clusters was a better choice because three and four are very close together. Um, so yeah, this is a very, very similar representation as we saw earlier with our PCA word vectors. Uh, but basically you can see that in our, um, oh, and what's also here, you, these are our top used words. Uh, if I click onto a bubble, you can see what are the most relevant words in topic one. So here, probably something about, um, probably something about election, like vote, government, you would have to look into some of it to a, a bit of like a post modeling idea to see what really is going on, but you can sort of see patterns arise. So election, voting party, in this one, you can see it's more about maybe the economy. So you have like percent, you have economic market, so and so forth. And in these, it's more around people, I think. So here you can see there's people, police, migrant, woman, attack, here, also kind of similar, you have like, um, I don't know. I know 1MDB is the Malaysian bank, um, but yeah, this is a pretty cool EDA tool, I think. Um, but yeah, just wanted to share this with you all. It's not in the curriculum, but I do think if you're doing an NLP project, this would be just cool to see, you know, what topics are being talked about in your corpus. So um, is this yeah. uh, relevant only to uh, the NLP model or this can be used for other things as well? Yeah, unfortunately, this is only for NLP because this specifically looks to pick out, uh, it, it looks to group meanings of words to, or meanings of documents together. Uh, so therefore, yeah, this is only uh, for NLP, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of things that you can play around here. Uh, the relevance metric, I believe, looks for like the separation between words. Um, I always have to like go back to documentation to remember exactly what this does, but it, uh, oh, right. I think it does something about like how specific to each topic a word is, um, something like that. But, but yeah, could be a really, really cool EDA tool. I will say the math that goes behind LDA, I know it's pretty complicated. I myself tried to read through it. I like couldn't. Um, so something on my to-do list, but uh, haven't gone there yet. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to share. Um, again, to reiterate, all of the, these things are in the appendix. So therefore, if you're doing an NLP project this time around, you do not have to include it. Although if you want to, you definitely can. Uh, these are more so things that if you're doing an NLP project for your capstone, um, I think would be very worthwhile to see. Again, not a must because it's in the appendix, but would be very, very worthwhile. I think it can add another layer to your project. Uh, but yeah, any questions to close out? <clears throat> for for learn.co, the next step, we should, should we look through this appendix stuff or if we want to, but also start focusing on the next one, which is um, section 40? Yeah, I, I would say it's really up to you. Um, the, the next study groups that are coming out are all on neural networks, uh, which I will actually preface those study groups by saying that most of you will not be working with neural networks at your first job. It's actually quite rare uh, for bootcamp grads to go into neural networks unless you really devote a lot of time. And I'm saying like months into it because there's a lot of theory uh, to to neural networks. It's like an, an entire college semester uh, that's solely focused on neural networks. So a lot of students, you know, just get like a high level understanding of neural networks and you'll be fine. So it's really up to you how you want to prioritize the material. Um, I have seen some really awesome neural network projects come out of the capstone. Um, so it's really what you want to focus on. Um, 
I will say since we've gone through like three out of four of the project topics, you can definitely start working on your project if you'd like. And I'm happy to talk about it at our one-on-ones as well. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, happy to talk about, you know, prioritizing, especially at this stage as we get into our mod four project leading into the capstone, happy to talk about, you know, plan for prioritization. Um, just because I will say in the capstone, there is time built in for you to revise material. So I wouldn't worry about getting everything down by the mod four project. Uh, but yeah, if you already have ideas for what you wanna do for this project, you can definitely start now. Or if you have ideas for the capstone, more than happy to talk about it too. Um, cool. Well, today my other cohort presented their mod four projects. They actually have another round of presentations tomorrow. So I'll link the I'll actually link the recording to their presentations as well as the Zoom link for tomorrow's presentations uh, when I send out this recording. All right, final questions to close out. I, oh, well, one thing is uh, uh, the Usain Bolt issue which Henry has. Mm -hmm. I just uh, the, why it is taking separately because like I saw that there is an uh, between the words there is an underscore, so it should take as a one word, right? Usain Bolt. Yeah, yeah, it it did see as one word. I think um, it's hard to say. I think, um, well, it depends on the pre-processing. I guess the pre-processing decided to keep it together. Uh, but yeah, I, it's, it is hard to say, I don't know. Um, again, it is a lot of like the, uh, the tree bank, it is hard coded. Um, and so I'm guessing it's probably trying to make a guess of what the best part of speech is for the words Usain Bolt, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right then, well, this closes out NLP. Um, the next three study groups are going to be on neural networks. So get ready for that. It's gonna be pretty deep. I'm gonna um, simplify as much as possible, uh, but yeah, it's gonna be a pretty intense next few study groups. But yeah, any thoughts or concerns, please send them my way. But if there's nothing else, have a good night, everybody. I will see you all back here on Thursday for our first neural network study group. All right, bye everyone. Bye, bye. good night.